We start with the simple observation. The world is divided up into the way the current organization of the world, the political organization, is into states. States. And the vast majority of those states, don't write down every word, that, that's crazy. You'll take all day to write down the words, you might as well get anything. Right? The vast majority of states in the world define themselves as nation states. What do we mean by that? We simply mean that most states get set up and they say, we are here, and even when they're democratic and liberal and believe in equality of rights, we say, we are here as a state to defend primarily the cultural and political interests of this one group. The Germans, Germany, the French, France, the Italians, Italy, Canada, the Canadians. Now you already see it's starting to get slightly more complicated at that last state. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that almost all states in the world, while they define themselves as nation states, have minorities. Have minorities. Almost every nation state in the world has a cultural and national minority within it. And it is generally expected that those minorities will have, and here gets the tricky part, rights. Rights. What kind of rights? Ah, that gets very tricky. Mostly, the basic liberal rights, the right to vote, freedom of speech. But do they have collective rights? Just to give you, let's, let's really give you a sharp example. Israel. Israel has, even within the 1967 borders of Israel, has about 19 to 20% of the people who are living there are not Jews. In the pre-67 borders, forget about the occupied territories, the pre-67 borders, there's about 19 to 20% of the people who are not Jews. Now, all of those people have the right to vote, they have the right to own land, they have the right to the basic set of liberal rights. However, however, the big disagreement, the big disagreement is on collective rights. That's at one end. That is, do they have rights as Palestinians, as Arabs? And the general answer is less, less. It's not that they have no rights, there are Arab schools. Lots. As a matter of fact, most Arabs in Israel go to Arab schools. Are those schools as good as Jewish schools? Do they get the same funding as Jewish schools? The answer is no. So that that's why it's free. It may be an extreme, but it is not unusual. Let's go to the United States. About 12% of the United States population is African American. About 12%. Do those African Americans have individual rights? Clearly. Clearly. The right to vote freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the basic palette of individual rights. Do they face discrimination individually? Absolutely. You can't prevent cultural discrimination very hard with a set of laws. Do they have collective rights? Hardly at all. Hardly at all. Could you conceive of the United States having a head of state who 
was an African American. Clearly. It exists. Right? I'm not making that up. I'd be fascinated. Ten years ago, ten years ago, I would have stood up and said, listen, I promise you if I would have tried to show of hands, I would have had 90% no. Now what's interesting is the United States, and this is what gets tricky. The United States doesn't define itself as a nation state. That is a state set up to protect the rights of Americans as a cultural group. Answer is sure. Yes. It's just that what it means to be an American, what it means to be an American, is different than what it means to be a Jew in Israel or a German in Germany. Why? Why? What is the definition of an American? Anybody have a definition for me? Not, and I don't want to have like someone who knows nothing about Canada. That's what I mean. that <laughs> Yeah. What is, what is, you put your hand up, right? So why do you put your hand up? What's that an answer? I go and 
I go through all the work to get my citizenship. And it takes a year, it's a long time. And ultimately, there's an exam. There's an exam. And of course, I'm laughing, and I say, ah, man, I teach political science. I mean, why an exam? What are they going to possibly ask me that I don't know? This is ridiculous. And so I'm at, I'm at, I'm at Harvard, and I go into my office and that morning, and I tell my neighbor, who's this guy from Poland, uh, he's a professor at Harvard, and I say, I say what are you doing? I said, I'm going to do my citizenship to, tomorrow morning. And he says, have you studied the green books? <laughs> I said, what green books? The green books. I say, ah, oh, I don't even speak with Greek books, but halfway through the day, I, I picture it, you know, Harvard postdoctoral fellow fails citizenship. <laughs> headline in the, in, the, in the Boston Globe. So I go back, I go home and I study the Greek books, which are all kinds of stuff about this part of the Constitution and that part of the Constitution, and it's fine. And I go in, and I take the exam, and I'm sitting in the waiting room. Uh, and I see there's a guy beside me. He's obviously South Asian. I, I don't ask him where he's from, but right? he's South Asian. And he has this like big sheet of papers with him. And he has on it, the President of the United States is, right? And he has Richard Nixon crossed out. Gerald Ford crossed out. Jimmy Carter crossed out. Ronald Reagan crossed out. George Bush crossed out. Bill Clinton. Says, this sheet of papers had got generations of South Asian, of his South Asian relatives through the citizenship exam. <laughs> right? It had been around that long. It's yellow and it's all. And what, the reason I'm telling you this long story is that what they cared about was politics, political loyalty. What are you loyal to? You're not loyal to a race, to an ethnicity. You're loyal to a set of political ideals. And the best proof of that is that after the exam, go in for your interview. And okay, and I met at the height of my er intellectual arrogance. You can imagine how arrogant I was. I mean, I'm much more arrogant than I am now. <laughs> to the height of my arrogance, and I go in, and there's this guy, right, you know, who's speaking in a thick working class Boston accent. <laughs> You know, the pack and cat and the half and gash. Talking to you about that one. And he says, okay, I just you know I'm not a fancy professor or anything. I was going, oh my god, such trouble. I'm not a fancy professor or anything like that. But you know, in Canada, you're from Canada, right? I said, yeah. He said, if Canada and the United States fought in a war, <laughs> which side would you fight on? No, he said, would you fight on the side of the United States? That's what he thought. Would you fight on the side of the United States? And of course, my answer was, you're damn right out there. <laughs> right? You ask that kind of question in the citizenship exam. That's, what kind of question is that? That's the, that's the do you love me question. <laughs> in a relationship, right? Someone says, I love you. Yuri gets a big moment. <laughs> you can see how he say, oh, it's not great. <laughs> I later learned, this is an interesting point, if you do not answer that question correctly, not only will you not get citizenship on that day, you will never get citizenship. That's the killer. That's the killer. I didn't know that at the time. That was how arrogant I was. I should have studied the green books. <laughs> but that's the point. It's political. It's not cultural. You can go in there and speak with a big accent like the people who are beside me. They didn't care. As a matter of fact, you can come in with your interpreter. It's actually fascinating. There's no cultural definition, even. They were making people take the exam in English. You could do your interview, your citizenship interview, in the United States of America with an interpreter. Just think about what that means. It means not only is there no, no racial, blood, religious, there's hardly even a cultural definition. It's almost purely political. Germany, on the other hand. Israel, Korea. Turkey. I mean, 
mean, the list goes on, it's very long. All of these countries have less of a political definition of citizenship than they do. They view themselves as a community of descent. A German is someone who was born to German parents. You could be living in Argentina and not even speak any German. Or you could be living in Russia. There are lots of Russian Volga Germans. Hardly speak any German at all. And they're considered German and they have the right to immediate citizenship. Of course, Israel has the right to the law of return for Jews. Not for Arabs. So this definition of citizenship is also fairly widespread. Okay. Which gets us into this really weird question. How do we get ourselves into this? How do we get to a world that is divided up into nations? How do we get nationalism? The Italians have not always existed. The, the, the French have not always existed. So the seemingly obvious answer to the question of what is nationalism is nationalism is the ideology of nations. Nationalism is the ideology of nations. And it sounds very logical. A group of people who have a set of ideas about themselves. The problem is, is this is completely wrong. It's completely wrong. Why? Well, let's ask ourselves first, what is a nation? It's a group of people who believe that they share a common faith, history, culture, and language. Nationalism tells us that the state and the culture should be congruent. That is, the French people should be ruled by a state that conducts its business in French. And the leaders of France should be French. But this fact of people believing that their leaders should be of the same cultural group as themselves, that is a modern phenomenon. That only exists over the last 250 years. It does not exist, it never existed before in human history. Never before did people insist that their leaders be of the same culture, and never did leaders try to get people to share a common culture. It was not desired, it was not necessary. Who cared what people 30 kilometers from you spoke? Who cared what your leader, your king, who you would never see? He didn't come make the rounds of the villages. Who cared what language he spoke or the queen spoke? This is a modern phenomenon. The sense that our leaders should be of the same cultural group as us. And it's this perceived need, this need that we feel that we have, that our leaders, that we share a common culture, and that our leaders share a common culture, and that our political unit should nurture that culture. I mean, if tomorrow, if tomorrow Stephen Harper got up and started giving a speech and said, said, hello Canadians. Ich werde dich aber geheimnis. Eigentlich, die Sprache hier in Kanada wird Deutsch sein. I have a secret. The Canada's language in Canada should be German. We all say, that's weird. <laughs> Who's this guy? Why does he want us all to speak German? Won't that advantage the German speakers? I've been waiting for this day. 
What that advantage the Germans do? The answer is no. It would. We don't want that. We've got all of this invested in English. And we don't want this other group, this tiny group in Canada, who be the German speakers, to all of a sudden have all the cool jobs. Be the CEOs, be the ambassadors. But that need, that need to, that, that need that we perceive, that we have, that our leaders should have share our culture and should protect our culture, that is a modern phenomenon. The whole world is chopped up into units today where cultures are protected by these big organizations called states. How do we do that? Simple. We have schooling in languages. You can't go, actually you can go in Canada, that's a weird thing, but in most countries, actually in Canada it's, all, it, it, it's very hard to go to a language in anything else but English or French. You can, but they don't provide a lot of them. Okay. So it's this need for congruence that's got to be explained. Let me stop there for a minute. I'm going to say, tell you something really radical in a couple of minutes. It's this. And I'm going to prove it to you. It's going to sound really stupid at first. Nations don't create the ideology of nationalism. Nationalism creates nations. Nations don't exist in themselves. <laughs> they don't exist in themselves. They are inventions. They are inventions. We just perceive them as being natural. Now, we as Canadians are in a really special place to be able to appreciate that fact. We're in a very special place because it's precisely because if we were in Italy, it would be hard to prove that to you. It's because Canadian identity is so thin. Culturally, at any rate. It's really cultural. It's so in the room. It's really thin. In the sense that we don't care where your parents are from. We don't care how you dress, what your religion is. We don't even care if you speak any, either of the national languages correctly. After all, Prime Minister Kretchen spoke either French or English very well. <laughs> <laughs> Rather, we have a kind of, we have a kind of, uh, our identity is, is, it is American in that sense, that it's highly political, it's highly constructive. You believe a certain set of principles, right? It's mostly these American individualist principles, which the, with some multiculturalism thrown in. I'll talk about it later on. So let any questions about where I've been so far? I haven't actually covered very much. I've given you some funny stories. <laughs> That's to get you interested in the subject. Ah, you like my sons, they play too many video games over the holidays, the brains are fried. Mm. Okay, let me just tie up the shoes and then we'll move on. Okay, so, next. If there's no questions, I'll push on. If there is, I don't see you wave your hand really hard. Okay. Yes, 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 sorry. Go ahead. Please. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, the Roman ancient, the ancient Roman concept of citizenship, it was interesting. It was, it was it, in some ways very similar to the political concept of citizenship. It was imperial. It was not, it was mostly not ethnic. Mostly not ethnic. That is, I say this because if you read your Cicero, you will see that the Romans were a little more equal than the others. And the others, the one living in Rome itself, 
but mostly it was a political definition, and in fact, modern Republican definitions of citizen, not in the American party sense of Republican, but modern sense of modern state non-monarchic definition of citizenship, um, it takes a lot from the Roman concept. Not a stupid question, it's a good question. It's just that it was not, first of all, not everybody was a citizen, as we know, right? Slaves were citizens. Uh, they had no passport system. The modern passport system, you might be interested to know, didn't really exist until the 20th century. There were no passports. You didn't travel that way. You didn't like walk over the border, right, with your with your piece of paper and then show it to somebody and they stamp it and say, you know, welcome to Canada. That's not the way it works. Most people never traveled anywhere. Or if they did, they traveled with you know, letters from kings and queens saying, you know, please treat this guy well. I like him. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. The question was, is multiculturalism Canada, how does that, how does that, that's a really good and hard question which deserves a whole course. The multiculturalism in Canada, how does that work with protecting individual rights? After all, multiculturalism is about protecting group rights. Give me an example. French in Quebec, right? French in Quebec. If tomorrow I move to Quebec, I move to Quebec, my children, by law, will have to go, if I send them to a public school, will have to go to a French school. That's the law in Quebec. I do not have the right to send them to an English school. My individual right as a parent, where I send my kids to school, is curtailed by what? By the collective need of the French to preserve French. So, who has the right to send their kids to English schools in Quebec? Anyone know? You're Canadians, you guys are Canadians, not me. I'm the interloper here. Those who are English who are born in Quebec. If you went to an English school yourself, you are members of the English minority and your rights are protected. But I, as a non-native English Quebec, do not have the rights. I am not considered part of that minority. And therefore, I am right for integration into the board, you know, into the body of French, French Canada. And my children will be too. So that's an example of individual rights at odds. And of course, there's the whole issue of French and English signage, and you know, should I get to put the signs in whatever language I want? So in Canada, we protect group rights all the time. Does that sometimes conflict with individual rights? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the famous Bill 101 in Quebec, which restricted you couldn't have English on any signs. And they first said, um, you couldn't have it on any commercial signs. And their argument was this, is that commercial speech, and people then disagreed, they said, that's a, that is a violation of our rights to free speech. I don't know right the charter that's protected in, but it's like the American First Amendment. Somebody in here is going to correct me. I know I'm going to face huge criticism for just saying that story. I just don't know that one. Which speech is that? Which one is that? Section 2. Thank you. Thank you. It's very important. I mean, most of all, all democracies have this, right? What they argued in Quebec, however, was that commercial speech and political speech are different. Political speech is protected. Commercial speech, commercial science is not political speech. So there you get into kind of conflicts between group rights and individual rights. Canada's not that unusual in this respect. It's not that unusual. You know, I've gone to Israel a lot. And Israel's got gigantic problems, huge, colossal problems, obviously. Right? You, don't, you, don't, you don't need me to tell you that. So one of the ways they deal with this is like you look at their money, they got English, Arabic, and Hebrew on the money. Now why? It's interesting, they're not actually making a multicultural statement there. They simply want people to know how much money is worth. 
<laughs> if you're walking from the dog, actually, that's why right. people don't know Hebrew, they only know Arabic, you got to learn Arabic. 20% of your population at the beginning, at any rate, didn't know Hebrew. They all know Hebrew fine now. But, they, but at the time, 